tired of talking about the coronavirus, so today I'm going to be doing a dramatic reading, or perhaps a dry and boring reading. Let me know what you think in the comments below. From my new book, The Liberal Media Industrial Complex, starting on page one. Today, media doesn't just mean television, radio, newspapers, and magazines, since all those industries have been swallowed up by the internet. Convergence, as it's technically called. As you know, people now get most of their news and entertainment online, where there is an endless supply of things to click on, scroll through, and stream. People carry TVs in their pockets and wear them on their wrists, like the old science fiction films predicted. With the push of a button, anyone can watch almost any show, access any newspaper or magazine article, and even send instant feedback about what they think. Everywhere you go, people are constantly glued to their device, consuming an endless stream of media. It's like a madhouse that's almost impossible to escape. In our current mobile age, trying to keep up with the news is like running on a treadmill that's getting faster and faster. The longer you're on it, the more exhausting it gets, leading many to become so fatigued that they decide to jump off and quit paying attention altogether. Many have become so stressed out, disgusted, and tired of the news, they basically boycott and only, follow, and only follow sports and other forms of entertainment. But even there, they can't escape being bombarded by political messages and cries for social justice. Those who wish to push political agendas know that movies, music, and TV shows are convenient vehicles to deliver their propaganda to millions under the cloak of entertainment. Even some sports coverage on ESPN has become political in recent years, amplifying the messages of athletes involved in fringe causes or ones based on half-truths and outright lies. Music, movies, and television shows are not just entertainment, they shape and influence the culture by manufacturing iconic characters whose beliefs and behaviors are mimicked by millions. While art imitates life, life also imitates art, as President Obama admitted during an appearance via video at the 2015 Grammys, where he told the audience, tonight we celebrate artists whose music and message help shape our culture. Artists have a unique power to change minds and attitudes and get us thinking and talking about what matters. Celebrities have largely taken over the role that families, the church, and national traditions used to play in molding and monitoring a nation's attitudes and actions. As Andrew Breitbart pointed out in his book Righteous Indignation, quote, Hollywood is more important than Washington. It can't be overstated how important this message is. Pop culture matters. What happens in front of the cameras, on a soundstage, in the Warner Brothers lot often makes more of a difference to the fate of America than what happens in the back rooms of the Rayburn House office building on Capitol Hill. He continues, As it stands, the Frankfurt School taught left is fighting the political battle on both political and cultural battlefields. Conservatives are fighting it only on the political battlefield. That means that art, humor, song, theater, television, film, dance are all devices used every day in order to influence the hearts and minds of the American people. He's talking about cultural Marxism, which is the practice of waging a psychological war against America and all of Western civilization by relentlessly attacking every aspect of our culture, symbols, and institutions, hoping to gradually weaken society by subverting its foundations to the point where it becomes so dysfunctional it can be overthrown and replaced by a Marxist state. To accomplish this, the supposed news media regularly engages in what's called agenda setting by hyping up certain stories and covering them ad nauseum to create the false impression that those stories are actually important because they're what people are talking about. This provides a false justification for the extensive coverage, creating an artificial feedback loop where they hype up a story as if it's the talk of the town, and then everyone starts talking about it because they're inundated by reports about it, so the media keeps reporting on it, claiming that it's a relevant story because so many people are talking about it. They carefully choose stories, oftentimes of rare and isolated instances, and then amplify them, hoping to give the impression that there's an epidemic, and use the cherry-picked examples to promote or reinforce liberal ideologies. At the same time, they act as gatekeepers, purposely omitting other actually important stories and events, which show a side of an issue they're hoping people don't hear about or are trying to downplay the significance of. The liberal media industrial complex uses their technology to influence rather than inform, to attack instead of educate, to promote certain events while pretending others don't exist. They always amplify salacious allegations that feed into the one-sided narratives they're pushing and then completely ignore the facts when they later come out if they prove the initial reports to be false. They just carry on as if nothing happened and keep repeating the same pattern like clockwork, amplifying the allegations and then ignoring the outcome. The election of President Trump has resulted in the American mainstream media throwing all objectivity out the window and dedicating their existence to painting him as a mentally deranged dictator who needs to be impeached or imprisoned. 
They've gotten so bold in their attempts to overthrow our republic that they now regularly engage in gaslighting and continue to repeat easily debunked falsehoods as if they're true, hoping to get people to start doubting their own memory, reasoning, and perception about what actually is going on. This is what gaslighting is. By repeatedly lying with confidence, using misdirection, and discounting contrary information, the media causes some people to begin questioning their own version of reality. The term gaslighting originates from an old 1938 play, later made into a movie in 1944, where a central theme of the plot involves a woman's husband who subjects her to all kinds of mind games trying to drive her insane, including dimming the gas lamps in their home, while convincing her that she's just imagining that it's getting darker. The media insists that the name George Soros is a code word for anti-Semitism, as are globalists and Hollywood liberals. The constant assertions that anyone who supports building the wall at the U.S.-Mexico border is racist, and anyone who supports President Trump is a white supremacist, are ridiculous, but are believed by gullible people who are susceptible to propaganda. Television news anchors lie with such assurance and being accompanied by symbols of authority like their fancy studios and graphics, on the surface it appears as if they're legitimate news broadcasts. The 2016 presidential election proved that the balance of power had shifted from the tight-knit group of mainstream media companies into the hands of everyday Americans who used Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube to spread their messages to others, whether it was a few hundred of their Facebook friends or an audience of millions if their posts went viral. So in order to regain control of the flow of information, the legacy media conglomerates began working closely with the Silicon Valley titans to rewrite the algorithms so these popular platforms would favor their content above that posted by ordinary people or popular social media personalities. It's an understatement to say that what's happening is a conspiracy between various sectors of the media industry which are working together to give traditional media outlets the loudest voices online. Mix in Google and YouTube manipulating search results, Wikipedia being the number one source of encyclopedia articles, and social media companies systematically censoring prominent conservative accounts under the disguise of combating hate speech, and you have a recipe for total information control. There is a reason that dictators throughout history have aimed to seize the country's media as one of their top priorities so they can use it not only to further their own aims, but to prevent their opposition from using it for theirs. Just two weeks after the shocking loss of Hillary Clinton to Donald Trump in the 2016 election, the war on fake news was launched as a smokescreen to suppress the reach of regular users' social media posts and artificially boost messages from the mainstream media. The Democrats became frantic about the supposed fake news being shared on Facebook that they claimed had cast Hillary in a false light, and that was the reason, they said, why so many people didn't trust her, and hence didn't vote for her. While there were a few fake viral news stories smearing her, all of the studies showed that they had no influence on people's votes and just reinforced the beliefs they already held about her. There were also fake stories about Donald Trump that went viral during the heat of the campaign, but that fact is ignored and the fake news problem was framed as an issue that's only one-sided. In reality, the fake news scare was just an elaborate ruse to dramatically alter the way social media functions by pressuring big tech companies to emphasize mainstream media outlets in people's feeds instead of showing organically what should be there based on who they were following and what was being posted. Barack Obama was the first social media president getting elected in 2008 when Facebook was first becoming a central hub in people's lives. He was the first president to have a Facebook page and a Twitter account, and his senior advisor David Axelrod later admitted, quote, if not for social media, Barack Obama would have never been elected president because it gave us the ability to connect to a new generation of voters. At the time, social media was kind of a novelty, but a few years later, it would permeate most people's lives when everyone had to have an iPhone and the social media companies released mobile apps so people could stay connected wherever they were instead of having to wait until they got home from work or school to open up their laptop to see what was happening online. But today, getting news online isn't just a novelty, it's the norm. A report from Pew Research in 2018 showed that more Americans get their news from posts on social media than from newspapers. Social media now starts revolutions, and overnight a single video clip can turn most of the world against a nation's leader, or galvanize members of an entire political party to rally behind a cause. Since the barriers to entry are now so low today with anyone being able to start a YouTube channel or create a Facebook page, we're seeing legacy media frantically trying to stop their industry and their influence from slipping through their fingers. 
Liberals' favorite tactic today is silencing their opposition under the disguise of combating hate speech or stopping right-wing extremists. And the ability to censor and manipulate information online rests in the hands of just a few gigantic corporations whose values are completely opposed to middle America and traditional family values. Because of the emergence of social media, billions of people around the world communicate through Facebook, Twitter, and other online platforms, which have largely taken the place of sending emails and talking on the phone. As you know, today, these social media apps can allow anyone's message to spread just as far as something broadcast on the national news or printed on the front page of the New York Times. But because of this massive redistribution of power, the liberal media industrial complex is scrambling to put the genie back in the bottle. One doesn't have to be a social media star to be a victim of the left's censorship because average users have their Facebook posts, tweets, Instagram pics, and YouTube videos removed all the time for violating community standards. Big tech's increasingly sophisticated artificial intelligence systems automatically scan every post for keywords that they have identified as sexist, racist, homophobic, Islamophobic, anti-Semitic, or just generally hateful or offensive, and has them removed once discovered. Just a handful of these violations and your entire account is shut down for good and everything you've ever posted there deleted. Nothing is out of the reach of their AI and anything can be deleted at any moment by the nameless and faceless moderators, leaving the victims with no recourse or appeal. Total control of information is what they want, and they've hijacked the technology we all use to communicate in our modern age. But thankfully, you were able to get this powerful tool into your hands before they could stop it. An old-fashioned book. I commend you for picking one up and tuning out the noise, relentlessly trying to make its way to your ears, and turning away from the millions of tweets, Facebook posts, and video clips, all competing for your attention. In the coming pages, we'll do a deep dive into each of the major social media platforms and I'll detail their algorithm manipulation, double standards, liberal bias, and censorship. We'll also dissect the media's war on President Trump, their mission to destroy our culture by undermining traditional family values, and we'll take a look at the future of fake news. While scrolling through tweets and Facebook posts is often like junk food for the brain, reading a book is a healthy and nourishing four-course meal in comparison. Sure, junk food is fine in moderation, but if it's all you eat, then you're going to be very unhealthy. And the difference between reading through social media feeds or watching the news and reading a book is about the same as the difference between a good steak and eating a burger at McDonald's. One is quick, cheap, and poor quality, while the other is expensive, time-consuming to make and healthy to eat. And since we're dealing with a very important subject, it's best to do this right. So let's begin by taking a look behind the curtain of the monolithic liberal media industrial complex and start dismantling it piece by piece. I know there's a lot of audiobook lovers out there, but that's the best that I can do for now. So let me know what you think in the comments below or give this video a thumbs up if you want me to continue this and maybe I can make a weekly series out of it. And of course, here comes the shameless plug. If you liked what you heard, order the book in paperback from Amazon.com or click the link in the description below or download the ebook from your tablet or your e-reading device.